Hi, I'm Jim Dennison with Dennison Forum, and this is the Daily Article for Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. The title is, Judge Rules That Christian Club Can Have Christian Leaders, Why Our Faith is Key to Experiencing the Power of God. Let's begin with good news you wouldn't think to be news. A Christian club in Michigan can legally require its leaders to be Christians. Inner Varsity Christian Fellowship is a student ministry that provides community and Bible studies on college and university campuses. It's been part of Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan for 75 years. The club is open to all students, but it requires its leaders to agree with the organization's statement of faith. As the Beckett Fund noted, Wayne State, quote, rightly allows fraternities to have only male leaders, female athletic clubs to have only female members, and African-American clubs to have only African-American leaders, end quote. However, it claimed that a Christian club should not be able to have only Christian leaders, deeming InterVarsity's leadership policies as discriminatory and deregistering the club in 2017. Judge Robert H. Cleland of the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan ruled last week that the university's actions, quote, strike at the heart, end quote, of the First Amendment and are, quote, obviously odious to the Constitution. He added that the school's attempts to dictate the club's leadership are categorically barred by the Constitution. This is not the only good news in the news. Premier Christian News is reporting that Prince Philip encouraged Queen Elizabeth II to talk more about her Christian faith ahead of her Christmas broadcast in the year 2000. Those who knew him well were not surprised. The Reverend Professor Ian Bradley has preached where the Queen attends services when staying at Balmoral, her estate in Scotland. He told Premier that Prince Philip, quote, would note down all the details of the sermon, end quote. He stated that Philip, quote, had a wonderful knowledge of the Bible, and then he would sort of quiz you at lunchtime, ask you about your sermon, and really put you on your mettle. Reverend Bradley added, quote, I was amazed at his biblical knowledge. I mean, we sat up one evening, talked almost far into the night about biblical references to the environment, his great interest, of course. He was very well steeped in the Bible. Many of us were unfamiliar with Prince Philip's faith or Judge Cleland's decision in favor of religious freedom. But our lack of knowledge makes these stories no less real. As Matthew 6, 6 says, we serve a God who sees in secret. 1 Corinthians 4 or 5 adds that he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness. In other words, God is working to advance his kingdom in ways we may not see. We should never judge his omniscience by our fallen minds or his omnipotence by our finitude. In recent days, I've been suggesting a case for Christian optimism based on the fact that it is always too soon to give up on God and that the risen Christ can still do anything he has done before. Our problem is that we tend to measure God's capacities by ours, assuming that we are experiencing all that he is doing. Ernst Trelsch, a 19th century liberal Protestant theologian, famously argued by his principle of analogy that there is, quote, an essential similarity between our humanity and the humanity of the past period. This approach to historiography examines reports of the past through the prism of the present. If people don't walk on water today, Jesus and Peter did not walk on the Sea of Galilee, they would say. If bodies don't rise from the dead today, Jesus did not rise from the dead, or so it's alleged. This mindset affects biblical Christians more than we might think. In the first church I pastored, a woman came to our Wednesday night prayer meeting with the news that she'd been diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer. We prayed fervently for her healing. She returned three weeks later with news that the cancer was gone. I will confess to you my first thought. I was glad the doctors were wrong. A young pastor complained to Charles Spurgeon that people weren't responding to his sermons. Spurgeon said, you don't expect them to respond every time you preach, do you? The young man assured the great preacher that he did not. Spurgeon replied, that's why they do not. With God, we often get what we expect, not because our faith limits God in any way, but because our faith limits our capacity to receive all that God intends to give. It's hard to pray for miracles if we don't expect miracles. It's hard to obey the word of God if we don't expect God to keep his word. Oswald Chambers was right when he said, thank God it is gloriously and majestically true that the Holy Spirit can work in us the very nature of Jesus if we will obey him. However, we must obey him. 
Chambers added these words, Faith never knows where it's being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading. If the second phase is true for us, the first is irrelevant. Jerry Parr was nine years old when he saw the 1939 movie Code of the Secret Service. The actor playing Agent Brass Bancroft was a young man named Ronald Reagan. At that moment, Parr dreamed of becoming a Secret Service agent. Parr went on to achieve his dream. Reagan went on to become President of the United States. On March 30, 1981, Parr was escorting Reagan to his limousine outside the Washington Hilton Hotel when an assailant opened fire. After shoving the president in the car, Parr made the decision to take him to George Washington University Hospital. First Lady Nancy Reagan later credited Parr with saving her husband's life. If you and I will stay faithful to the last word we heard from God and open to the next, he will use us in ways we may never anticipate. We cannot measure the eternal significance of present faithfulness. Will you judge God's capacity to use you by your abilities or by his?